microphone check. One, two, the microphone check. One, two, one, two, the microphone check. I got my headphones tuned between two different AM stations and my briefcase is full of declassified information. Declassified, uh huh, mm -hmm. declassified. Good evening and welcome to News from Neptune for the fifth week of 2013. For more than 20 years, this program has been a spontaneous and unrehearsed discussion of the news of the week and its coverage by the media. First on a so-called community radio station, and when censored and locked out of there, welcomed, I'm happy to say, by the good people at Urbana Public Television. I'm Carl Osterbrook. My discussants tonight are David Green and Ron Zoke. We'll take turns suggesting an item from the week's news that's been ignored or misreported, sometimes even innocently, and then giving the others a chance to comment on it. Our program's name, News from Neptune, was chosen to honor Noam Chomsky, who's been talking since about American politics for more than twice the 20 years we've been on the air. Chomsky has said that in the American media, quote, either you repeat the same conventional doctrines everybody is saying, or else you say something true, and you will sound like it's from Neptune. Today is February 1st, a day to think about economic explo exploitation in America. Of course, a lot of days are good days to think about that. But on this day in 1861, the government of Texas seceded from the United States of America. In a, and on this day, four years to the day later, in 1865, President Abraham Lincoln signed the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, the amendment banning slavery. Uh, it suggests that that's what the war was about, and I think that's true, although not perhaps in the way we normally celebrate it in American mythology. Uh, the question is posed again by one of a trio of movies that are being uh, uh, awarded prizes uh, in the prize-giving season in Hollywood, the Golden Globes and the Academy Awards and so forth. Uh, the three movies are Zero Dark Thirty, Argo, and Lincoln. Lincoln belongs in this group of, which, of what are essentially propaganda exercises about American politics, although it's the least um, blatant, perhaps, of the three. A uh, good article on the film on the Z website says, and I quote, the film's aim is to give today's liberal politics a sense of historical permanence and affirm the U.S. political system. Just like Lincoln, so Obama. It tells us that for all its flaws, the system works, given well-chosen pragmatism and compromise, and that limited representative democracy, that is to say, electing a leader who knows best, some might wonder about that definition, but still, that that is the route to progress. Thus, history is made by the great liberal individual and universally loved embodiment of the American dream. Abraham Lincoln, of course. Guess who the analog today is, it's suggested. It is a familiar treatise upon American values, the political game, and the power of rational persuasion, the film. As such, its implication towards the partisan stalemates of current U.S. politics lack depth, ignore systemic deficiencies, and tiresomely parrot the rhetoric of President Obama. Of course, it does not go so far as to advocate torture, which, by the way, the other films in this trio do. Uh, its pro-war stance, though, pro-war, we're talking about the Civil War, but of course the uh, slippage happens quickly. Its pro-war stance is barely concealed. Still represents the, the un, it still represents the uncritical voice of the U.S. film industry to no smaller degree than Zero Dark Thirty, the pro-torture movie does. I think that's essentially correct. Uh, it's a more sophisticated job. It takes some more uh, deconstruction, perhaps, to see what's really going on. Um, and uh, it also has the uh, advantage, if that's what it is, of having some tremendous actors, uh, the uh, Daniel Day-Lewis and, uh, uh, and several others of the first water, really. Uh, these are additions that make the uh, uh, political pill uh, somewhat easier to swallow. Uh, the... Uh, 
The notion that the Civil War was about abolishing slavery uh, is true uh, after a fashion, but what we don't much reflect on these days is that the war was a conflict between two ruling classes, a northern and a southern ruling class in the United States, one of which exploited labor uh, by chattel slavery and the other of which exploited labor by the wage contract. Uh, the uh, uh, way the equal exchange between agents which reproduces hourly and daily inequality and oppression as it has been described. Now, uh, as several acute American politicians pointed out, uh, the American economy, the American society could not exist with these two systems sitting side by side, half slave and half free, it was said. Uh, one had to destroy the other. So long as they were geographically limited, uh, it was not too much of a problem. Uh, chattel slavery in the South, wage slavery in the North, uh, and it produced some funny examples, such as uh, New Orleanian plantation owners uh, hiring Irishmen from New York uh, to drain the swamps around New Orleans because it was too risky business to risk valuable slaves on. You could always buy another Irishman, but uh, slave, a slave was a big investment. Now, the debate between these two modes of production uh, stopped being geographical after the Mexican War, when the, the uh, discussion was which system would uh, organize the territories taken from Mexico. Uh, the Republican Party was founded on the principle of no extension of slavery, which meant, in fact, wage slavery in the, in the conquered territories, not chattel slavery. And that was the issue. Uh, on which uh, the war finally broke out when the North attacked the South uh, in the, uh, when, when the first Republican president was elected. Um, this history of the Civil War has been transmogrified into a story of a war for the abolition of slavery, which is pr literally true, and the anniversaries of today point that out, but we have to understand that the slavery was being abolished because it was a threat to the wage slavery of the dominant economic classes in, yeah, in the North. Uh, a story that is full of implications, it seems to me, for today, and therefore has to be sugar-coated, reinterpreted, uh, represented, and it seems to me that that's what Hollywood's in the business of doing, particularly in Spielberg's new film, Lincoln. So, you're listening to News from Neptune, a Civil War edition, uh, and Ron Zoke will fire the first shot. <clears throat> yes, I want to call attention to a curious article that appeared in the uh, local daily yesterday, a unsigned AP dispatch, economic pause in late 12 tied to slash in defense spending. <laughs> <clears throat> the U.S. economy shrank unexpectedly late last year by a very tiny amount. A reminder of the biggest threat it faces in 2013, sh uh, sharp government spending cuts and prolonged political budget fights. So uh, it appears that uh, this slight uh, retreat in the uh, national economy was due to uh, government not spending enough, especially on uh, armaments, uh, military spending. Uh, this says the likelihood of, inner, of another recession of the uh, 0809 type uh, appears r remote. The economy is forecast to grow around 2% uh, this year as strength in areas like housing and auto sales could partly offset government cutbacks. Investors appear unfazed too. The stock market has surged more than 6% this year and is nearing an all-time high. And indeed, uh, it's up uh, remarkably uh, this morning as well. So uh, we uh, approach the holy of, holy, here's, uh, holy of holies here, investor confidence, and it seems to be very high. Uh, and uh, if this article is, is correct, it's because the government uh, we'll be spending more in uh, uh, 
armaments uh, sales uh, for the big defense contractors, meaning military contractors primarily. So uh, this leads to the next point then. Uh, what are the prospects of a uh, sequestration contraction uh, in two months at the end of March? Deep spending cuts, this says, in defense and domestic programs are set to kick in March 1st. Most of the federal government could shut down March 27th if Congress doesn't extend a temporary measure authorizing funding and the nation's borrowing limit must be raised by May 18th or the government could default on its uh, debt. So this drag on the growth of the economy, uh, according to this article, is due to the federal government uh, not spending enough. At the same time, we're told that the uh, constraint on growth is because the federal government is spending uh, too much. We're hearing that from other sources and uh, uh, are taxing uh, people, the uh, job creators and the wealth creators uh, too much. Uh, so that's the other constraint on uh, economic growth. So we must all bow down to economic growth, but uh, is what is limiting it uh, due to too much government spending or not enough? And we're getting both stories here within the space of uh, a uh, few short paragraphs. This says the drag from the government continues or comes as private sector growth is picking up. Consumers and businesses spent more in the October, December quarter compared with the July, September uh, quarter. So uh, is the government uh, spending too much or uh, not enough? A uh, curious companion piece then in today's Washington Post, as sequestration looms, and that, by the way, is my uh, nomination for the term that uh, can be terminated uh, yes. this week. Sequestration yeah. looms. Yeah, good. Contractors don't fret. Uh, <clears throat> in a new f uh, the next few months, they... Uh, this could look even scarier than in the past few for defense contractors already battered by federal budget cuts. Thanks to the threat of automatic reductions coming in, looming in March. But industry executives had a surprising message for shareholders this week. Don't worry about it. Hey. As they say in New York, forget about it. <laughs> in call after call with investors, officials at some of the area's largest contracting firms refused to guess how much it would cost them if Congress allows the sequester to kick in on March 1st. Even as uh, their lobbyists keep warning on how much the cuts would hurt the industry, the executives are projecting confidence that the sequester will not happen. Their influence, uh, really control over Congress is sufficient that they're saying, don't worry about it, forget about it, it won't forget happen. It. Uh, <clears throat> their confidence defies the emerging consensus on Capitol Hill that Congress will not find an agreement in time to cancel or delay the cuts. So uh, this uh, says that the executives do not appear to believe that this will come to pass. It may be because Congress keeps averting fiscal crises at the very last minute and because the Obama administration asked contractors last year not to issue layoff notices in preparation for cuts that uh, were originally scheduled to begin this month. It may be also because contracting firms appear confident in their ability to lobby for sequester relief. Contractors are one of the first groups to cry out about those possible economic effects, warning that the cuts would damage not only their bottom lines and their workforces, but also the broader defense industry. The companies attended rallies this summer and announced that they were considering issuing layoff notices to all of their employees. So they were really saying scary stuff. But the Labor Department and the Office of Management and Budget persuaded companies not to issue those notices, a signal that seemed to calm the industry and suggest that sequestration might not happen, a sentiment bolstered by the delay of the January deadline. So this amounted to mixed signals, according to uh, one analyst from the Obama administration to the industry. The Aerospace Industries Association, the main defense industry lobbying group, has sent loud and constant signals that sequestration would be devastating, including a news release Wednesday. 
Meanwhile, small manufacturers who supply the larger contractors are beginning to speak out about how the sequester cuts would affect their businesses. So uh, this is coming from the chief economist of the National Association of Manufacturers. So uh, if the government uh, doesn't spend as, uh, as much, cuts back on the spending, this will create another economic crisis. And we don't want that, do we? So uh, uh, there it is. Uh, which way should we go? If the government spends more, uh, it's guilty. And if it spends less, it's uh, also guilty. It's that goddamn gummit that's at the bottom of all of our troubles and problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. probably too. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Ron. Uh, uh, got a take on this, David? Has the confidence well, fairy touched you this week? Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, uh, it, it just it, uh, reminds me that there's also a small item in the, in the local paper this morning about um, the state of Illinois spending on roads. Uh, there's something like $500 million dollars that is available for good for just you know infrastructure spending that certainly would help the economy in ways that are more more so than defense spending um, and they were and the last uh, sentence of this article I think quotes the uh, Chamber of Commerce head for the university for not not for the university for the for the Illinois State Chamber of Commerce um, those people that are opposed to government spending and that feel that they should deregulate and do all this stuff. But he was all for it. You know, it was like, this is a no-brainer. I think th that was the exact <laughs> words that were used. <laughs> They've got to get, to, in order to get this money from this hundred-something million dollars right. from the federal government, they've got to match it with another three or four hundred million dollars from the state government and uh. get to work repairing our, our roads. Um, just a good basic thing we ought to be doing along with many other things. So the question arises from this, you know, you read one article and um, they're talking about government, the importance of government spending. The, another article, the, they're talking about how we have to cut back on government spending, how government gets in the way of free enterprise and the free market and all that. And is the purpose of the media to confuse people about these issues, to lie to people about these issues, or just to dissuade people from even thinking about these, these is, is issues because they're always presented in a way that doesn't, that doesn't you know, what, what the left hand is doing is no business to what the right hand's doing. Take on that, Ron? Yeah, well, it's the, uh, possibly the same as the arguments about uh, climate change and global warming, the uh, 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 deniers don't have to uh, convince us that it is uh, not happening. All they have to do is create enough confusion in the public mind that uh, no action will be taken. They, that reminds me of the example of uh, a usage of sequestration that you were talking about, Ron, a little yeah. different from the uh, 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 sense in which you nominated it for Coburn's Corner that we do at the end of the show. Uh, apparently at a news conference the other day, uh, reporters were asking uh, Stephen Chu, I think that's his name, the Energy Secretary, um, about uh, the sequ sequestration uh, end of March that you were describing and what would that mean for the Energy Department and so forth. Um, and the scientific Mr. Chu, uh, hearing the sequestration, launched on a five-minute discussion of uh, carbon sequestration, <laughs> uh, which apparently is the process whereby carbon that's released in the atmosphere is refixed into the soil or something. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a technical problem, an issue of the climate change issue. But apparently he talked for five, ten minutes before they realized, uh, no, sir, that's not the sequestration <laughs> we're interested in. So, so yeah, yeah, there is a Never problem. Mind. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> In fact, he may have been talking about the real problem, and the one, yeah. the other one was the false yeah. problem, as you suggest. Yeah, that was uh, what Emily Latello used to say. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Never mind. Um, uh, back to the notion of uh, defense spending and the well, the point you started with, the argument that it was a, a hesitation in defense spending uh, in 2012 that led to the bad economic news and the the, the Tim, the percentage point decline in GDP uh, announced uh, this week. Um, 
I'm going to suggest that the phrase defense spending goes straight to the guillotine um, because it's such an obvious propaganda notion. Uh, but in fact, it includes some, re some real problems. I mean, we know that when we're talking about defense spending, we're talking about profits for arms makers, weapons yes. makers. Yes. Uh, defense, I mean, everybody knows that, and it's, it's one of those euphemisms that become so obvious that we don't even notice it anymore. But the actual effect of defense spending is a little more complex, maybe, than was suggested either by the article that you mentioned or by those people who say that, uh, you know, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we've, we've got to sequester defense spending. Sorry. Um, uh, in macro terms, we know that the, uh, for all the things the New Deal did for the Great Depression, it didn't in fact solve the Great Depression. The Great Depression uh, was an exercise, or the New Deal was an exercise in government spending, uh, uh, stimulus, uh, stimulus program, as we would say now, uh, designed to uh, increase aggregate demand and produce a, a healthier economy, uh, the lack of aggregate demand being the best analysis of why the Depression had taken place in the first place. And this was, uh, uh, in fact, accomplished not by the New Deal, but by war spending. Uh, the U.S. involvement in the Second World War and the massive war spending and employment, uh, which, by the way, relates to the point we started with at the top of the hour, the sla slavery and the second slavery, as it was called, the position of uh, uh, the uh, particularly black workforce between 1865 and the outbreak of the Second World War. Um, but the uh, uh, problem uh, that the uh, uh, war as cure for the Depression uh, leaves is that today it's not obviously the case that defense spending produces employment as it did in 1941. Uh, so the article that you started with assumed that, uh, assumed saying, okay, the downturn in the economy has to do with the fact there wasn't enough defense spending. We needed to, 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 to uh, raise it a bit uh, in 2012, and therefore and we would have had this problem. In fact, defense spending today, as opposed to defense spending in World War II, results not so much in, not so, so much in employment as in profits for the arms makers. Right. Uh, uh, the actual employment effect of uh, an in incremental uh, addition to defense spending is very, very small. That wasn't true in 1941. Uh, so the argument needs to be sorted out. We need to think more about the fundamental point, uh, the Keynesian point, if you like, that government spending is necessary for a healthy economy. But it's not at all clear that any government spending will do it, or even, is it clear, which particular government spending will do it? Better yet, the roads, than more money for Lockheed. Hmm? Yeah. That, that provokes me to, to, to make an aside about the, also the, the contractor aspect, what, what we've referred to before in criticizing the use of the word contractor in terms of defense spending. Um, and we see these companies, these global companies, these vultures now descending on, on Mali and other parts of Africa with their services, rendering their services. And so that's another aspect of how the money, how some aspect of defense spending um, is probably unrelated to, to employment in this country as we understand it on a kind of everyday, everyday basis. Um, another little aside I just wanted to make, I, I recently saw an interesting, well done do documentary about the Civilian Conservation Corps uh -huh. during the 1930s. Yeah. And I guess it kind of raises the issue. It was very well done and focused on the experiences of four by the time this was made, obviously, elderly men, and it was a good thing it was made. They're, they're probably, probably not, not long now, but, but um, uh, that the, the C Civilian Conservation Corps put people to work so quickly in, a, in an era before, obviously, before the kind of t technology available that, that's available now, put, put people to work in large numbers in, a, in an organized and in fact, military way. I mean, it was all predicated on military. So we see the irony of putting people to work on the one hand in what be, might be seen as a model for government-sponsored work programs, but in a kind of military hierarchical context in which, in fact, translated, these gentlemen all proceeded into the military when 1940 or 41 came, came, came around. We were prepared in that sense for World War II. So... Um, 
you know, history co comes up with these <laughs> these in, in interesting con con conundrums about um, how how we stimulate the economy in in a in a kind of an honest way, but at the same right. time um, always sort of justifying it in quasi military terms. Yeah. I remember taking a road trip years ago now down the West Coast, just driving from, from uh, Portland to San Francisco. Um, and driving along the Oregon coast, I was impressed at how much of the coastline in Oregon uh, had been constructed by the CCC during the, all these sort of public parks, mm -hmm. basically the entire coast, um, was uh, public land that uh, was uh, constructed uh, during the 30s by the uh, uh, Civilian Cons Conservation Corps. Um, then we crossed the border into, uh, and it really was a border, into California. Uh, and indeed, we were stopped there to make sure that we weren't bringing in any illegal fruit. That's what they said, at least. Um, illegal fruit from the Northwest into California. Uh, interesting. Um, but the, uh, uh, the change was, A, we could no longer drive along the coast because what had been public land in Oregon was now all in private hands. And the land in private hands was not, of course, available to the public and not available and not built up the way the CCC land had been uh, in on the Oregon coast. The contrast was quite striking. Uh, and I gather it changes in various ways as one works one's way down the coast. But for me, as an inveterate East Coaster, here I was in a foreign land, seeing how they did things and seeing an interesting illustration of the difference, perhaps, of public and private uh, employment uh, in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, during the Depression on the West Coast. So, uh, I made that trip last, last summer and when you would be encouraged to know I, that we were not stopped for fruit. Oh, really? Our, <laughs> way from Oregon into California. Uh -huh, uh -huh. <laughs> so we got all our, our kumquats and our <laughs> whatever, and brought, brought them right in. Uh, <laughs> I remember that happening somewhere, but... Uh, nice to yeah, know that kumquats can run free in California. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> where it was, where they started yeah. inspecting the car for any kind of plant material, but I'm not sure uh, that's yeah. any, happening any longer. Yeah. Uh, didn't I read that the... Uh, Government, the Obama administration quietly closed down its job creation panel uh, this last week. Um, well, it was the labor. Panel. Yeah. yeah, 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 right. And yeah. So, but this was this was. I mean, remember when Obama was elected the first time? It was a popular understanding that what this would mean would be some sort of federal jobs program because that was obviously what was needed in the. Uh, uh, in the wake of the Great Recession, and with various announcements of uh, jobs uh, panels labor panels uh, with, um, what was it, a General Electric uh, official, at the CEO on the, at the head of it? Um, the Obama administration tried to redeem its promise for jobs. Well, it didn't redeem it very well, although they keep trying to say that they did, but last week they quietly shut down this panel that was supposed to do it. Now, look, everybody knows that if the Obama administration was going to do anything serious about the Great Recession when it came to office. What it needed to do was set up something like the WPA, the CCC, the various New Deal organization that actually provided jobs. But it didn't do that. Why didn't it do that? Because the National Association of Manufacturers, the Chamber of Commerce, that you generally, they don't want it. If the, if the government goes into the business of providing jobs, uh, then that competes for labor with uh, the, the industries, which you now can get away with paying uh, uh, very bad wages indeed. Uh, it is impossible for someone making win minimum wage to rent a two-bedroom apartment in any city in the United States. Now, uh, you can't afford it. It doesn't even come close. Now, this is the situation that most Americans live with. Uh, instead of doing anything about it, the government says, "Well, of course, we're trying to encourage. We're going to give uh, uh, we're going to give companies um, uh, benefits uh, if they increase their employment. Uh, we'll we'll uh, give breaks, tax breaks, to the job creators one way or another, and hope that they will create jobs." Well, this is simply wrong. Uh, the jobs should be created, but they should be created as the New Deal did. We have anybody saying that in this country, besides us? I don't think so. And, and, and beyond that, people, this allows uh, the, the um, pundits to claim that the stimulus package failed right. when it provided, 
it wasn't nearly large enough and has provided we would have a couple of million jobs less than we do now, according to what some studies show, but that instead people can be confused and misled by thinking that somehow because the stimulus package, because the fairly uh, minimal stimulus package uh, has just allowed us to have a uh, uh, this sort of minute recovery that Ron referred to before, not really any kind of a takeoff, but but the kind of re recovery that will take us uh, along this pace another 10 years to get back to the already too high level of unemployment that we had before 2008. The standard uh, diagnosis uh, is that these are palliatives and uh, they're just designed to keep social unrest down to a tolerable level. But uh, as Carl says, they're not really uh, sweeping solutions to uh, anything. And uh, so we, uh, do we uh, denounce them uh, because of that, that they're not perfect and complete mm -hmm. solutions? Well, yeah. uh, well uh, that's the, that's the uh, dilemma that, liberal, that yeah. our current regime of sort of liberal politics always presents to right, us. Right. You know, yeah. uh, uh, a, a half of a piece of the pie or less, yeah. rather than none. Yeah. See the same argument about Obamacare, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, uh, again, the argument being, which goes back to uh, Voltaire, I'm told, he's quoting some other uh, author that uh, the perfect is, a, is uh, the enemy of the good, or the, as some people put it, the good with a capital G is the enemy of the better. And, and that's a, that's the, a hard one. The lesser evil is the enemy of pure yeah. evil. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> And then we have the acute analysis of uh, Glenn Ford and his colleagues at the Black Agenda Report talking about the fact that the current government is not a lesser evil, it's simply the more effective evil. Uh, and it maintains uh, the, this, this, this control with, by a, a patina of reform. Uh, and that seems to me to be quite right. You're watching uh, News from Neptune. Uh, we'll go to David Green for uh, perhaps something more uplifting and uh, encouraging. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Inspire us, David. Come on. Yeah, give us, just give, because give, it's give us hope, David. Just because it's Groundhog Day tomorrow, you expect <laughs> right. some kind of a expect me to to. So we get, have to keep get, doing the same get, thing get over and over. Right. Again. We expect you to come back. Or, yeah. yeah. We come back and uh, do it again tomorrow. <laughs> well, I I wanted to mention two, actually not very upbeat topics. Oh dear. Uh, of course, um, one is that of Ven 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 Venezuela. Uh, uh -huh. It's been a bad week for mainstream media coverage of Venezuela, which I just wanted that's, to, that's new. To, to note <laughs> to note in passing, a particularly bad week even for the, the usual week. Um, yeah, uh, and I would refer you to a couple of critiques that have been done about this. One is by Mark Weisbrot in, on several yeah. websites, including the CEPR.net website, uh, responding to several of these outrageous um, report, reporting report uh, reports about uh, Venezuela and Chavez and so forth. Um, the other um, is on the FAIR website, the FAIR.org website, the Fairness and Accur Accuracy and re Reporting website by their, one of their uh, commentators, Jim, Jim Norekis, uh, also referring in particular to a New Yorker, uh, an extended New Yorker article about Venezuela by uh, a journalist named John Lee Anderson who apparently is well known. I had not known of him before this, and um, I was kind of expecting, I don't know why I was expecting to read something a little better, but it really, to, yeah. to read a, a kind of a hit job in this uh, over-the-top criticism of, of Chavez and of these people living in an abandoned, in an abandoned building in Car Caracas, um, uh, the, what, you know, you know Norekis, uh, the, the title of, of his, of his of his critique was something to the effect of, why do why do liberal why do liberal reporters for the New, New Yorker or what problem do they have with poor Ven, Ven, Venezuelans living in a building that nobody nobody else wants? Um, it's it's just it's outrageous. And I would add a local note to that. There's a political science professor on our campus named Damaris Kanash C A N A C H E who did a brief interview with the, the on-campus media outlet, the Illini Media, whatever, and which was picked up by the News Gazette a couple of Sundays ago. Uh, just a, a few brief comments about Chavez being an authoritarian and 
this and that, the other thing, not mentioning, as none of these art articles do, what, what the nature of the essentially democratic nature of Chavez's reforms, uh, establishing a constitutional democratic procedure, which will, in fact, uh, continue after he, he dies. Um, and he probably will die soon, it sounds like. Um, and not to mention the ec economic progress, the lessening of poverty, the provision of medical care and ed education and free public ed ed education at a level that was not, uh, that has not been seen in Venezuela prior to Chavez's coming to power um, about 14 or 15 years, years ago. Uh, so I wanted to mention that, uh, I meant to mention it in passing. Uh, and let me go on just to mention another, another item from the week's media coverage of their, uh, uh, along, along the line of movies uh, different uh -huh. kinds of movie, do documentary movies. Uh, there was an Israeli filmmaker who's made a movie called The Gatekeepers, mm -hmm. who was interviewed by Amy Goodman on Democracy Now! earlier this week. Uh, his name is Dror Morech. And um, it was an interesting interview in the fact that it was kind of unscripted. Uh, he took offense at the fact that he thought, even though he's, he's done a movie, which exposes the doubts that Israeli intelligence chiefs, that six past Israeli Shin Bet mm -hmm. chiefs have with Israelis' uh, occupation and so forth. He took offense at the fact that, that Amy Goodman and her, her co-host seem to be presenting the, the movie in a sort of unbalanced context in which Palestinians and Israelis weren't both given equal blame for what's going, going on there. And um, and um, it 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 gave me a kind of a start, and I mean I'm not. It's I kind of understand where this guy's coming from, and and this is the reason why I'm not terribly enthusiastic about films like this. I think they there's a, a certain style of Israeli filmmaking, uh, a, a sort of confessional style, that's uh, that's taken off in recent years, in which is, Israelis reveal their own doubts and their own concerns and their own problems. And I, I have failed to see and continue to fail see, to see in the light of the gatekeepers, which I'm sure will be talked about and maybe even playing at the local art theater and so forth. Um, I fail to see how this really moves uh, uh, a just solution, a possible solution forward. I feel that Israelis should take, if they, whatever share, whatever small percentage of share or zero percentage of share w that the Palestinians have in in victimizing themselves, if that could even be argued, um, Israelis, it seems to me, have to take the, re the re responsibility for their part of this problem. And it seems like his words on uh, in this in this interview earlier this week show the real shortcomings in 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 people who claim to be in the peace movement and the anti-occupation movement in Israel actually walking the walk. The, what, what the potential is for them walking the walk, I see it as being fairly minimal. Hmm. Uh, the movie's been compared to the one of, um, f I'm blocking on the filmmaker's name. Uh, Five Broken Cameras, or? No, actually, I was that? thinking of the much earlier film, the Robert McNamara film. Oh, The Fog they, of War, yeah. The Fog of War, precisely. Yeah, right. Um, and uh, in which McNamara admits that he had d doubts about the war, and his doubts about, he's talking about the Vietnam War, and his doubts about the war, and everyone has said, ah, oh, isn't it interesting, Fog of War, now we find it was a mistake, and so forth, and so on. I I mean, and I have the same hesitations about that f film that I understand you have about this one, David, mm -hmm. uh, in that um, uh, in the aftermath of Vietnam, everyone said, ah, yes, well, here's the, here's the reconsideration. But in fact, there wasn't any real consideration. McNamara had pres presided over the uh, American murder of four million people in Southeast Asia, and then he comes around and says, well, it wasn't clear that we could win the war anyhow, and uh, you know, we probably should have been clearer about the fact that we couldn't win the war. I mean, you know, what, what, what if, what's going on here? Uh, retrospective justification, and it seemed to me we saw an example of that um, in the uh, hearings this week about the new defense secretary, uh, Chuck Hagel, um, and in which uh, we were treated to 
a discussion that was dismissed by one local liberal as, what are these 60-year-old men talking about a long-ago war for? You know, we, what we need is term limits to get these people out of the, uh, out, out of the uh, uh, Senate and get some young people in there who'll do the right thing. Uh, this is madness, quite frankly. Um, what's going on here is the justification of the ongoing American military stance uh, in Vietnam and in the Middle East. And our failure to see that these things are continuous uh, and consistent leads us to think, oh yes, well, mistakes were made uh, in the 1960s. Uh, mistakes were made uh, in the invasion of Iraq. Mistakes were made perhaps even, even as late, even as late as uh, uh, Mr. Obama's surge in Afghanistan. But of course, uh, what we do is have to correct that mistakes and go on in a way in which the consistent American imperial policy is uh, done in a good way. Uh, in an effective way. Uh, this is the more effective evil that Glenn Ford is talking about, and that's what seemed to me was being called for by the, uh, uh, the panel in Congress this week and what Mr. Hagel um, is uh, designed to um, uh, uh, encourage. Uh, the, uh, Chomsky talked about that years ago in terms of the doctrine of change of course. Well, we've corrected the mistakes. We've changed the course. Of course, we haven't because the goals and the actions remain the same, but the egregious uh, uh, crimes that they've produced uh, now mean that we have to cover sin with smooth names in some way. The New York Times, in its account of the, uh, uh, the Hegel hearings this week, said, and I quote, Mr. Hegel said he would keep up pressure through special operations forces and drones on terrorist groups in Yemen, Somalia, and North Africa, close quote. The euphemism, keep up pressure, means that Hegel will support Obama's assassinations by drone and special operation death squads, vicious and unconstitutional killings of men, women, and children in countries with which we are not at war. What else is new? We've had this last week uh, an account of an important new book by Nick Terse, about how the Vietnam War was fought. Uh, it was fought uh, uh, as a series of My Lai disasters in which American soldiers uh, raped uh, people, killed children, uh, destroyed uh, villages uh, in order to uh, reduce a country to obedience. Uh, once again, nothing has changed. Uh, and Mr. Hegel, who has been presented by good American liberals as being an uh, indication that um, uh, Obama wants to change course, wants to do better, uh, is more of the same. And it seems to me that uh, this tradition of, uh, uh, of admitting minor mistakes so that the major policy continues, just as it has all along, uh, that that's uh, what we're involved with it seems in the in the Hegel nomination for defense secretary comments gentlemen uh, well I'll, I just wanted to sort of finish up the Israel thing because I think the analogy is is how the settlement mu movement is viewed in Israel uh -huh. and how and the the uh, the line that the filmmaker um, of, of the gatekeepers is putting forth and it's and it's it's a it's it's a revisionist in the worst sense of the word history of how the occupation came to be. These are, and, and it's encouraged by, of course, the recent election in which the rise of the settler movement in terms of political parties was seen as possible. It didn't turn out to be quite as, as, uh, as successful as it, as it was, as it was billed. But the, the, the occupation has been a part of Israeli government part, uh, policy of both political parties, very analogous to anything about U.S. foreign policy in relationship to both of the major parties in this country. Um, so the, the line that you'll hear from the maker of the gatekeepers that the threat to Israel and to a just settlement of the occupation lies within the settlers movement. Well, yes, they've created a settlers movement yeah. and it does have power. but. Um, that's not where it started. It started with, with a by, with in, in Israel, a multipartisan, since they have many political parties, uh, uh, almost none of which opposed 
have opposed the occupation, which has been expanding since 67 or really since the 1970s. What do you make, David, of this week's UN report uh, calling, for, pointing out that settlements are illegal and calling for their end? Uh, mean anything or is this more of the same? I can't imagine what it means in practical terms, yep. but I'd be happy to find out it, do, it well, does mean something. It suggested that in practical terms it may mean that if the Palestinian Authority uh, can use, the Palestinian Authority can use this report uh, to go to the ICC uh, and the, the, the uh, uh, International Criminal Court and bring a case against uh, um, uh, Israel for the mm -hmm. event, for war crimes, basically uh, the settlements being, un, by the definition of this week's report, war crimes. Uh, anything going to happen here, or will the U.S. simply provide they needed diplomatic cover in the U.N.? Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I can't imagine. You said it's hard to imagine like, the United States will allow. I mean, yeah, it, exactly. it will not allow any, right. anything to to emerge from this that. Uh, um, might be a legal, sort of a legalistic solution to this, to this problem. I mean, I don't, um, I don't know how many, uh, <laughs> it's like the old thing, how many, are, how many, uh, how many divisions does, does the Pope have? Uh, how many divisions <laughs> does, does the, the uh, uh -huh. International Criminal Court or whatever it is have? Interesting. You're watching news from Neptune. We've come to Coburn's Corner. Uh, the corner has an edge, indeed a sharp edge. The last writing from the late journalist Alexander Coburn was a pamphlet called Guillotined, in which Coburn nominates cliches, overused phrases, and tedious words for elimination. We want to carry on his great work by adding our own suspects to the kill list, which after all is a lot less literally lethal than Barack Obama's kill list. Uh, Ron has already started today. You had a couple of good ones, I thought, Ron. What, uh, sequestration? Yeah. Oh, and oh, and then I would suggest defense spending should yeah. go on the kill list. Yeah, I'll there. throw in austerity also. Austerity, <laughs> hey, look, that's, that's, that's good on both. Yeah. Austerity news for this week. Yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, what, what the U.S. government wants to avoid, of course, is any equation between the, uh, the anti-austerity movement in Europe and similar movements in the United States, even though the government, move, the government actions are, in fact, similar. Uh, there was an interesting story this week about how um, Iceland, uh, which has done most, perhaps, of fighting off the austerity style uh, enforced by the international banks, mainly by fighting off the international banks, also this week threw out uh, the FBI. Uh, the FBI apparently arrived in force in uh, Iceland to go after WikiLeaks and look for information for which WikiLeaks could be prosecuted and Julian Assange, of course, uh, holed up in the embassy in London, couldn't be prosecuted. Uh, the, uh, they didn't, <laughs> the FBI in typical fashion simply arrived, uh, flew into um, uh, the Reykjavik and uh, called up the local police authorities and said, we want your information on WikiLeaks. Well, they called their, the local police authorities called their government. The government said, hey, uh, these guys don't have permission to be here. Uh, got in touch with the FBI and fellows and threw them out. Now, this, uh, this is heartening. This is good. This uh, Iceland, tiny Iceland, seems to be doing things right uh, in regard to austerity and in regard to uh, the Obama administration's fight against uh, freedom of the press and, and, and whistleblowing. So, hey, good news on the austerity front, maybe? Maybe? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, David, you got a, a, a nominee for uh, the Coburn's Corner? Yeah, I, I know I had something that got lost during the week, so I'm okay. going to fall back on something I've been meaning to use. All right. And it is consistent with uh, what we've been talking about. Um, I often refer to the rep website Mondo Weiss, which is a, a wonderful source of sort of all things Jewish about the Israel-Palestinian conflict. Uh, and um, one of, and I'm I'm critical of Philip Weiss in a lot of ways for reasons I've talked about uh, on this on this show before. Uh, his promoting of the ideas, these ideas of the power of the Israel lobby to determine U.S. foreign policy and the issue of dual loyalty, which I think is a non-issue among uh, even, uh, you know, would, would anybody say that uh, Lindsey Graham has a problem with dual loyalty? Uh, but <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but uh, I think Philip Weiss would. One of his uh, favorite ex expressions is game changer, and of course that permeates the, the media in a lot of ways, uh, along with other sports, uh, met, 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 sports metaphors. Yeah. Uh, 
And um, I guess I've come to think over the, year, over the years that followed, especially the Israel-Palestine conflict, where it's seen that something is a possible breakthrough, a game changer. Um, somebody comes out, somebody makes a film, um, somebody decides to say something nice about the Palestinians for, 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 for a change, or uh, the Israel lobby is being exposed for what it is. And um, I guess, uh, you know, back to the sort of previous relative pessimism about this issue and the world at large, um, I don't really see any game changers coming along. Uh, in, in any on any fronts, <laughs> I mean, you can watch the Super Bowl on Sunday and maybe uh, see a game changer. Okay, oh yeah. but uh, <laughs> but uh, we have work to do, and that is organizing people to oppose government policies. And there are events that can instigate such things, like what happened in tu you know Tunisia in uh, right. two two years ago that that began these effects. But even then, we can see. They have a lot of work to do. But do you have any skin in the game? A phrase I'm hearing more and more often. <laughs> what does that mean? Yeah. Yeah, is, that a, is that a, that's a poker phrase, right? I think I so. Oh. But why skin? Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. right. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah, right. Um, the, uh, uh, I, I want to flash back here, too, a bit, uh, David, for my, my candidate this week. Um, I mentioned conspiracy theory as a candidate for the, uh, how did you put it, uh, uh, Ron, the ultimate haircut? Yeah. Um, uh, conspiracy theory, uh, in part because it's been used so variously in American politics and usually in a way to obfuscate rather than to make clear. Yeah. Uh, in fact, you know, it has a perfectly good, a conspiracy theory uh, a, is a theory of the way in which a group of actors, whoever they were, bree breathed together, which is what conspiracy means literally, breathed together and planned something which they then set out to accomplish. Okay, so the notion that there is a conspiracy theory, uh, the notion that there is a conspiracy, a theory that there is such a conspiracy is perfectly useful uh, when there is. Um, uh, was it a conspiracy for the National Association of Manufacturers at the end of the Second World War to view with alarm the fact that uh, since the war had solved the Depression, such as it was in the U.S., the Depression would come back when the war ended? and that they needed to do something, a conspiracy, to make sure that the U.S. remained on a war footing in order to prevent the recurrence of the, uh, of the Depression. Is that a conspiracy theory about, the, about business propaganda uh, in the wake of the Second World War? Well, in fact, there's one, one extremely good book on the subject, published, I'm happy to say, by the University of Illinois Press a number of years ago, by Elizabeth Thones Wolf, that mm. describes in detail exactly how this happened. It was a vast and conscious conspiracy. Is neoliberalism a conspiracy? Is, is, the, is the assertion that there, neoliberalism exists as a conscious plan of American economic elites to counter the 60s, that is, that series of ideas about politics and society that grew out of the 1960s? Uh, neoliberalism is, con is conscious. Neoliberalism is effective. Uh, neoliberalism is a uh, conspiracy. Uh, that's the theory that exists is obvious. So the useful usefulness of the notion is simply the recognition that there are covert or unannounced interests at work in politics, uh, and that if we dig a little, we can find them and see them. That seems perfectly yeah, reasonable. Well, You're not all, happy with this, Ron. Well, all you need is a convergence of interests and a group of people with similar interests who kind of understand each other. And, uh, Want to do then, something about it. Yeah, and then uh, they will be uh, charged with uh, a conspiracy. So, but yeah, this I charge think. is accurate. The well, charge is correct. Sometimes, yeah. I, I think, sometimes. I, think I, I came across a, a quote by uh, William Appleman Williams, a late revisionist historian in the best sense of the word, yes, uh, right. where I think he said something to the effect of, and he was trying to sort of fend off the notion of being a conspiracy theorist. He's, and I think he said something, something like, uh, people, sharing con uh, people sharing a conscious purpose does not make, does not make them con conspirators. That's fine. Right. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah, right. but setting out to do something about that and particularly hiding what they're doing or at least misrepresenting with propaganda what they're doing, yeah. that does make a conspiracy, it seems to me, that works very well. Here's a classic usage in American policy which seems to me to be one of the best examples of what the psychologists call projection. I'm quoting now here uh, from John Fitzgerald Kennedy's State of the Union message in 1961. We are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covert means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations, close quote. Now, I could find no better description of American policy in the world in 1961 than that. Kennedy purported to be talking about the Soviet conspiracy at a time when the Soviet Union, the total uh, GDP of the Soviet, of the, uh, uh, of the communist world, didn't approach 50% of that of the United States. Um, but, uh, you know, so uh, hence projection. But conspiracy theory, yeah, there was a conspiracy going on in America in 1961, and it was precisely what the American government was doing to maintain the disparity. Uh, as they described it in internal documents. We have been, uh, <coughs> you've been watching news from Neptune. Oh, yes, Ron, talk about that right now before we go. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Tuesday evening, February 5th, 7.30 p.m., there will be a free showing of a new film, The House I Live In, about the supposed war on drugs. It got a kind of negative review, short review, in the uh, News Gazette Thursday. But uh, uh, I'm told by a number of people that it's very much worth seeing. In the past 40 years, the war on drugs has accounted for over 45 million arrests. This film, directed by, uh, produced by Danny Glover, Brad Pitt, and Russell Simmons, is the first critical analysis of the war on drugs to hit the uh, big screen. So uh, it's notorious that this has led to the USA having more people in uh, prison, uh, both in absolute numbers and percentage of the population than any other country uh, in the world. And uh, it's done a great deal, in my opinion, to discredit law enforcement, uh, all this craziness about people having a few grams of uh, pot or smoking it or uh, something. So uh, the war on drugs is uh, uh, corrupting the police, I'm afraid. It's uh, destroying their uh, credibility. And uh, uh, I think it'd be this would be a good thing to see because it seems to cover some of those questions. Our thanks to UPTV, especially Jake, Jason, and Caleb. Inshallah, we'll be back next week with a new edition of News from Neptune to remind you in the words of Edward de Vere, what's past is prologue, what to come, and yours and my discharge. This is Carl Esterbrook for David Green and Jaron Zoak, uh, saying, in the meantime, confusion to our enemies, and a good night to you.